I still can't eat a lot of the foods that I love to eat. So it's been a, a lifestyle change in that regard. I struggle with my, my dentures a lot, and I'm running in the bathroom and re-gluing. And so I believe this is gonna, all that's gonna stop. They'll be in, they'll be stable, and it'll be more like having as close as I can get at this point to having my, my original teeth is what my expectation is. I believe that when this is all over, I'll be eating like a 20-year-old again. In this segment, we will demonstrate the use of the Implant Logic System software to treatment plan the implant selection and surgical placement for Patricia's case. The program allows the user to scroll through the individual slices. The panoramic series contains the vertical CT slices going from the front of the mouth to the back, or back of the mouth to the front. Whichever CT panel we are scrolling in, whether panoramic, cross-section, or axial, you will see that panel's color line track the movements in the other two panels. Here we see the set of blue lines following our positions with respect to the panoramic and axial fields. The cross-sections clearly show the patient's mental foramen, as well as the condition of the ridge and buccal and lingual cortical plates. The area between the mental forema is of particular interest to us as the implants will be placed in this anterior region. The scanner's field of view setting, in conjunction with VIP's self-processing capabilities, will determine how much of the posterior arch will be displayed. In this scan, the axial slices progress from the lower aspect of the mandible up to the occlusal plane. The indentations of the mental forema are plainly seen. Mapping the inferior alveolar nerve canal allows us to place implants with confidence, knowing the proximity of the nerve can be established. VIP performs this function easily by calling on the Edit Nerve feature, and with several clicks of the mouse, the entire nerve and its extension through the mental foramen is quickly drawn. Simply pick a panoramic slice to start. Anchor the first point in the posterior and proceed mesially. Within seconds, both sides can be completed. Enlarging the image facilitates the placing of implants. Defining a default implant speeds up treatment planning in multiple implant cases. First, select Sterngold from the manufacturer list. Choose a product line and part number. Notice the implant dimensions alongside. We are selecting 3.25 millimeter implants. Saving the settings allows us to focus on positioning the implants with minimal time and effort. Measuring tools accurately determine distances, angles, areas, and average densities. Shown here, a ruler tool is used to gauge the edge of the implant from the mental foramen. In selecting the 2.2 millimeter implants, you will notice the manufacturer's default color differs from the 3.25 millimeter implant previously placed. Labeling can be customized. In this plan, the ordinal numbering system has been changed to reflect tooth position. Implant position is adjusted by dragging the implant's body directly. Likewise, the angulation can be changed by dragging the implant from above or below its body. The implant parallel function allows the user to choose a target implant and immediately align the other implants parallel to it. Opening the 3D view, rotating the image and enlarging it illustrates how effective VIP's parallel mechanism operates. In many cases, the surgical guide can be held in place with nothing more than finger pressure. In an edentulous case, such as ours, placing pins such as Implant Logic's CompuPins in the guide will yield maximum stability during the surgery. The pins are planned using generic 2 mm by 19 mm implants and positioned laterally into the alveolus. Viewing in 3D, we can apply visibility to the mandible as well as controlling its opacity. The partial opaque view shows substructures within the bone. 100% opacity allows us to check that the implants are properly submerged. Full 3D rotation affords us a complete 360-degree perspective. 
A full screen 3D view with the mandible removed will clearly show an implant to implant relationship such as position, proximity and angulation. What we're going to be doing this morning is uh, five implants on the upper and five on the lower to ultimately retain her upper and lower denture. And uh, we did a surgical guide based on um, CT scan. This is the appliance that was created from the software treatment plan, which ultimately came from the CT uh, appliance that she wore during the CT scan. So to uh, eliminate things down the road as far as after we have the implants placed, we have to retrofit her existing denture. So we're going to be doing some of that as we're doing the surgery. And a, a good way to start is we'll place our uh, surgical guide. And then we get our Thompson's marking stick and we, we mark the areas where these implants will be placed. Then we take our denture and seat the denture. And what comes out is an area where uh, the implants will be uh, uh, intersecting the soft tissue. We won't have the uh, angle corrections in at this time, but we want to relieve these areas because ultimately the success of integration in the maxilla due to the poor bone uh, is keeping the denture from uh, touching these implants during the healing phase. And so we'll relieve this sufficiently. We'll still have our uh, nice uh, palatal stop. She has a good post dam. So in, in our case here, we, we won't need to place any additional implants as transitionals to protect our primary implants because the denture was uh, fabricated recently and it was uh, nicely done. So. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, start taking some of this acrylic out in these areas, and we'll do the same thing on the lower. This is the lower surgical guide, that, which was produced in the same manner. And on the lower, these are wonderful systems if we can stabilize the lower denture, because in fact, most of the people that are having these procedures done in the lower are having it done because they have no retention at all. And so therefore, it's imperative that we make sure that we have this surgical guide in the same position that the uh, CT guide was in when the CT scan was taken. And that, that, that allows us to have the accuracy that we want. And in order to do that, what they have provided us with is three pins, which were also created from the surgical guide, that, that uh, insert into the bone and stabilize the stenture in the position that the scan was taken, which makes life much easier. And if you're a computer literate like I am and are still able to use the system, it makes it Wonderful. So it's, it's a, a system that uh, allows you to treatment plan with you and the lab getting together and proactively deciding where you're going to set the teeth based on where the implants are going to be placed based on the availability of bone. And even if you choose not to do a case, uh, it is a wonderful tool as a diagnostic tool. You might find that it, you look like you have a wonderful ridge. You do the CT scan. In fact, the ridge is not what you thought it to be nor is the quality of bone. So you're going to quantify and qualify the type of bone you have before you get uh, into the surgical uh, region. And in many cases, uh, we can do a flapless procedure or a modified flapless procedure. Things that will dictate whether we can do a flapless procedure are A, do we know where the structures are we want to avoid, and B, do we have adequate attached tissue after the implant is placed. And so if those two are checked off positively, you know where you don't want to be, and you have the implants away from that area. In this case, it would be the neurovascular bundle. You know the buccolingual extent of the bone based on the CT scan so that you know that the implant's going to be placed in the confines of that buccolingual bony corridor. And you also know, based on these markings, whether we're going to have enough attached tissue. Then it's simply going in and placing the implants and not having to subject the patient to all other uh, procedures such as uh, producing a flap and sutures, etc. So what we've done here is done something similar. We've marked through the, our guide where the implants are going to, to be placed. 
as you see here. We then reposition our denture. As you see here, and our marks come out something like this. So we'll reduce those areas a little bit more on, uh, on the lower because we're going to actually have our uh, male uh, or female complete and we'll pick up uh, the housings in the lower, so we're going to take a little bit more out. Prior to that, however, we're going to also do one last thing that we need to do before we, uh, and that is a denture positioning registration. And I say positioning because if you have a lower uh, negative uh, lower ridge, the bite registration is based on where, where the, uh, the, the patient was at the time that they closed. That may not be the same place each time. And what we're going to do now is not, uh, this positioning uh, registration is not like a bite registration because we want some on the buccal and lingual area to lock this denture in the same place uh, that she came in with so that when we pick the attachments up, she walks out with the occlusion that we've already predetermined is okay for what we're going to be doing. Which brings another point up. Sometimes patients will come in with a bag of dentures. Close for me, please. Let me have some more. Because they've gone from dentist to dentist trying to find a better result, i.e. asking the same question, hoping for a different answer, and uh, so there's where their disappointment is. What we're going to try to produce at, at the time of surgery today is we're going to stabilize that denture, give her, give her stability. Retention is added benefit. If we can do that, then we've, uh, we've given her something that she, uh, she's really asked for and our patients have asked for. Okay. So uh, ultimately, when, um, when we're uh, doing something like this, uh, then we regain the confidence. However, if they have the bag of dentures, you have to select the one that will best be able to be retrofit. I usually don't talk about doing a new denture to these folks until I've able to uh, establish uh, the first thing they came in for stability, which is why they have a bag of dentures. We're asking a different question, and we're going to get a different answer, which means we can stabilize these dentures, um, but be very selective because you have to know where the implants are going so that you have the, the denture base and the teeth over the, the ridge that you think it is. And some of these negative ridges, you'll find that the genial tubercle ends up being where you think the ridge is. We're going to go ahead and take this out now. Open for me. So we've got our markings, as you can see here, upper, lower, and our denture relation registration. So while I'm starting to uh, work on the lower, we're going to have uh, this uh, done in another room by your assistant, preferably by your lab technician in, in certain states if you have denturists. They can be doing this while you're doing what you do best. Thus that the patient will be in the chair less time because we're doing two things at once. Now what we're going to do is reposition our, our lower stent and place our uh, retention pins so that this is stable. Now on Patricia here, uh, this is a very stable appliance and we probably uh, would not need to do this, but it certainly doesn't help, hurt because if there's tongue movement or, or anything such as that while you're placing the implants, uh, that could alter uh, the position of this. So it's, it's not a bad idea, especially on the lower. In the maxilla with a, a high vault, you'll find that it may not be necessary. Uh, so the first thing we'll be doing is uh, going in and, and providing a preparation, a two millimeter preparation that was pre-selected uh, through the software so it puts it where it's not going to interfere with your primary implants, nor is it going to be an area that's going to be uh, jeopardize the neurovascular bundle or anything that you may need uh, as your definitive uh, restoration. The ILS system, as you'll see, that uh, it's pretty foolproof. Uh, once you have treatment plan, and by the way, your treatment planning to make sure that you're understanding where you want the implants placed. If you're nervous because it's your first case, there's safety net because it, it is always reviewed by the staff at ILS so that what you get back should be something that you have a little more confidence. About 50% of the folks we train with this system for dentures that have never placed implants before go on to do their own single tooth implants as a result of knowing where they are. You'll see that the different guides are color-coded 
and it's virtually impossible to place this further into bone than your treatment plan. So therefore, you really, really have to work to have a problem with the system, provided you've done your homework ahead of time. I'll also show you the paperwork that comes back from the ILS system, and it'll tell you you go into the bone with a red, blue, or green burr to the depth, and therefore that's all you have to do. You take that out, and then you insert your pins. So we'll go ahead and get started. For our purposes, our retention screws to retain this lower stent are red, blue, red. So we'll do our red uh, preparations, then come back and do our blue. And you'll see here that hopefully that you can see that there's a stop right on, right on the edge here. That will bottom out. I can't go any further into the bone uh, than that will allow me. And if you're going at an angle like this, you're going to find that it doesn't go down into the hole. So it prevents you from basically doing what you don't want to do, being in the wrong position. So we're going to stabilize this. People often ask me, what speed do I need to, to do, or can I use an endomotor for placing implants? The answer to the second question is no, because you don't have torque control. Uh, the answer to the first question, uh, it's a range. Anywhere from 1,200 to 1,800 RPMs is, is acceptable by most pl uh, people placing implants and uh, with irrigation. Uh, torque control, I have torque all the way up uh, when I'm doing my osteotomies. Uh, I turn the torque down if I'm going to deliver the implant to 35 newton centimeters because uh, that's the maximum force I would like to place on the bone implant interface as I'm uh, placing the implant. So here we go, we're going to go our two reds and then uh, and that will be our retention screw. Give me a blue please and one of the one of the pins. These are the uh, the, the pins that will hold our uh, stents in place. A lot of times you want to use uh, retraction, and that's all well and good once you have this uh, surgical guide stabilized. But if you don't, you you stand the possibility of moving the stent. So once we get these um, pins placed, let's go in there. They will come back and retract the lips so that everybody can see it a little bit better. The speed or torque setting I use for these is the same as I am for uh, I use for my osteotomies, uh, because uh, we we discovered that when we, we when we uh, did the treatment plan that she has, as usual, most people no matter how much resorption they have in the mandible, you're going to be dealing in in type one bone. With these implants, because they're smaller, it's also key that you don't oversize your osteotomy. So it's it's a trial the first one you place, and I'll I'll go through that trial. Uh, I have an indication of what's, what I'm going to need to do because I've done a lot of these, but I want to take you through it as if this is my first case to show you what trial error I will need to establish that the osteotomy is appropriate for the implant. And then once I use that, I use the same uh, combination, whether it's uh, where they have to tap or don't have to tap, on all of them. The key here is to use the burr that you're using so you don't need it anymore and then move on to the next burr rather than going back and forth. Much like when you do endo with, a, with an apex locator, we would put the, do the apex locator, then what would we do? We'd take an x-ray, so we'd go to a more advanced technology and then revert to something less advanced until we get our comfort zone. The same will be true here, so don't be afraid to go in and place your, your first osteotomy and take an x-ray if you're concerned where you are, because it doesn't hurt. 
that once you get accustomed to how accurate this is, then you feel more comfortable with doing that. Our treatment plan is to put three 325 by 15 ERA implants uh, in the midline and, and the two most posterior ones. The intermediate implants, uh, which are going to be what we call sacrificial lambs in the mandible, usually is not really the case because most all the time, if our occlusion is proper, uh, those will integrate, but we'll, we'll use the 2.2 by 15. Now, you could, you could always go 325 on all five of them in, in her case, uh, but uh, once you get beyond the, the, the fact that a 2.2 implant by 15 will do what's necessary, uh, you know, then you, you can save a little bit of money uh, and a little bit of time by using the 2.2. And in many, in many cases, uh, most of the clinicians, if, if they have the druthers, would rather, if the bone is narrow, they would rather put a smaller 2.2 implant if the bone is narrow so they have more bone surrounding it rather than trying to put a wider implant and have a thin bone. So we'll go ahead and place our inserts. As you saw in the guide, there's a insertion tool and it's dummy proof, so you can't put the wrong insertion tool in because here is the, uh, one of the guides. So now you have two options. You can go intraorally and place your insert, which uh, is fraught with potential problems unless you have a throat pack. Or since we have ability to reposition now our surgical guide, we're going to take the surgical guide out and place our inserts. Okay? So just a, 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 a food for thought. So we'll go ahead and take our surgical guide out. Because we've placed our, our, our uh, osteotomies for the, the retention pins so that we can reposition it accurately. And now extra orally, we can go ahead and place our 1.6 insert. So here's the insertion pin. You'll, you'll notice that when you place it, you make a turn to lock it in place because now it's, it's secured and it's not going to be moving around or potentially uh, come out while you're, you're placing your osteotomy. We'll place all five of our 1.6s. We've shown you the surgical guide without the inserts that was used to help us locate where the implants are going to be placed for our denture. So that can be uh, being worked on while we're now getting ready to... Um, start our osteotomies. We've placed our pins to secure this lower surgical guide so it's repeatable in the same position. The same position that it was in when the, the CT scan was taken. And we've also placed our insert outside the mouth, the 1.6 inserts, which is the first burr and will be the last burr most likely for our 2.2 um, implants and the next to last burr for our 325. So now we just refer to our guide. It will say, on, and you pick an area, obviously. You don't know exactly where these are going since it's a denture, but if you call the uh, most distal implant 21, that's the way the report comes back. And it will say 21, and it will tell us the burr size uh, or color, and, uh, and it will tell you the depth or the length of the burr. That doesn't mean the depth or the length into bone, but from the point of the top of this surgical guide, it's so many millimeters, which will allow us to go through the surgical guide and into the uh, bone at the level that we've predetermined we wanted to be. So the beauty of this is that uh, keep the KISS theory, you know, we're going to keep it simple. Rather than going up and down different burrs, they've said, okay, our point of reference will vary so that the burr size or the color will be the same, so we're not switching back and forth. Here's the 1.6, and we're going to be a, it's 1.6 green. And you need to make sure it's the 1.6, not the 2.0, because obviously the 2.0 is not going to go into uh, the 1.6 guide. And hopefully you can see at the, the flat area here, that's what bottoms out on our insert. In an extremely hard bone, if you don't have enough, this is why you could not use uh, an endo hand piece, because in an extremely hard bone, you won't have the torque to go through. And it's, it's better to have high torque an adequate amount of RPM so that you're not creating uh, adverse effect on uh, the uh, site of the osteotomy, which will ev eventually be the source of bone growth for our implant. Okay, so we've got these in place. Now we have to have our patient stretch really wide. And what you want to do is keep this going full speed when you go in there. 
And if we want to take this off just to see where we are when we start, we want to make sure that um, the, bur the, 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 the initial osteotomy, if you're not sure where it's going, you can take it off and see that you're right in the, the crest, uh, the area of the crest you want to be, and that the implant will continue going, or the, the osteotomy is, is going in the right direction. Reposition it. If you, anytime you have a question, take the stent off, look and see where things are, and then re reposition it because it's easy to reposition once you have these uh, pins that secure the plate. So let's go ahead and put our pins back in. So we're comfortable we're going in the right direction, have our patient open once again. And now we just go ahead and continue with our osteotomies. One. Open real big one. There we go. And after you've done a few of these, you, you can determine this bone. You can feel how hard it is by the, 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 the amount of time it takes to go through. Open just a little bit for me. One last time, Patricia, open real big for me, please. Open for me. Now, if you want, you can go. You, you can check and make sure that you're comfortable where these are by placing the parallel and pins that come in your kit. We we know that this is type one bone, and after you do a few of these, you'll know that. Uh, that you're going to have to go to depth uh, with your 1.6 as well as your 2.4, and you may or may not have to tap. So what I'm going to do now is take the guide out, show you how uh, these are going in, and that, in fact, they are parallel. Then I'll reinsert the guide with the 2.4 um, interface so that we can uh, place our 2.4 osteotomy in the area of the 3.25 implants. As you notice that without the guide, you're requested, you, you have to use a round bird to make a pilot hole because it jumps all over the place. Well, in fact, uh, since you have this guide, it stabilizes that burr so that we, bi we bypass one uh, or maybe two burrs to at least get this into this very, very hard bone. And we've also diagnosed that we have an adequate width of bone, at least 3.5 millimeters at the uh, occlusal surface, so I don't have to flatten uh, the bone in that area. However, if I did notice that the occlusal surface was narrower than three millimeters, I could include that in my treatment plan so that I can make the osteotomy such that uh, when I do flatten it to that width, I am where I want to be. Without this, uh, you're, you're going to find in this extremely dense bone, it may be a little hard to stabilize that burr, and you might even have to go in with a high-speed handpiece to get the first pilot hole going so that you can then try to stabilize the rest of the osteotomies. And, Sometimes that is fraud, especially when you're trying to make these parallel. Uh, you get it going in one direction, and, and if the bone is, if the if the burr is jumping around a bit, you might find that in fact, you might not be exactly where you want to be. The beauty of the system, it just, as you saw, I I started, uh, I placed the burr uh, into the insert slightly, and I started my motor, and I didn't stop it till I was able to come out. And it's, and you'll find that you don't want, in most cases, to pump up and down, because you don't want to enlarge uh, this osteotomy. Uh, when you're freehanding, that's a very possible uh, scenario. However, with this, as you saw, I did pump up and down a little bit because the bone was extremely hard. But what the beauty of this is that uh, the, uh, the burr was stabilized so that it wasn't going to create something larger than a 1.6. So what we're going to do now is remove our surgical guy, check with our patient, still if we're, see if we're still on her Christmas mailing list and if she needs any more anesthetic, and then go back and uh, use the 2.4 insert for our 325 implants, okay? So as I'm taking this out, what I'm going to do is remove uh, the area for the 2.2 so that there's no room for error here. I'm only gonna insert the 2.4 uh, insert 
in the in sites that I need. In the uh, two intermediate sites, there's not going to be an insert so that I can inadvertently uh, go in an area and enlarge the uh, osteotomy to a point that I couldn't use for a 2.2. Now remember, these are color-coded, but you have to look in, on there at the size, and it's hard to look to see the difference between a 2.0 and a 1.6. So uh, have your staff, uh, as, if, if they've trained you as well as my staff has trained me, uh, I get a, a hand slap if I don't put the burr back in the same position it came out of because then uh, it's easier for them to go back and, and sterilize and, and keep it sequential and not have to strain their eyes to see what size burr uh, that they're dealing with. So while we're uh, placing the other inserts, I'm going to place the parallel guide to, to see if, in fact, I am where I want to be. When you're doing these things, it's, it's, it's never bad. If you're in doubt, go ahead and check and see that uh, before you go into the next step, that you've accomplished what you, what you wanted to in the first step. So let's go and see if, if we've done the job we want. And if you're freehanding this and, and not doing the surgical guide, um, what happens if you don't get them exactly parallel? Well, that's the beauty of having the angle corrected uh, option, which means, you know, I can alter that. And if you have these patients that may be paralyzed on one side, they may want to alter the path insertion. Even though they are zero degree, you may choose to alter the path insertion. So a lot of times, uh, if in question of what, uh, the path insertion that I'm going to be, be using because the caregiver wasn't there, or uh, I will go ahead and put the, the uh, angle-corrected ERA implants that would allow me at uh, the time that we get ready to restore this patient to determine the path of insertion that would be best suited for this patient to remove uh, uh, and uh, reseat her denture.